I am New York. Yes, I'm New York. I am New York. Yo soy Nueva York. Sono New York. Just me New York. We are New York. Welcome to Diverse City, where we explore New York's eclectic enclaves one neighborhood at a time. I'm Zyphus Lebron. This month, we're here on Governor's Island. The 172-acre attraction is in the midst of major changes. Already, once derelict buildings have been repurposed into artist studios and a school. Then there's the rezoning plan that's expected to develop potentially millions of square feet into commercial, academic and mixed-use spaces. The island has a deep history in the harbour, going back to the 1600s when it got its name. It was also the site for high-level political meetings. The former Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev and President Ronald Reagan met here during the Cold War. The exiled Haitian leader, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, signed an accord here that returned democracy to his island in the early 90s. Now, under new leadership, the location that was once a secret summer getaway is on the fast track to becoming a year-round attraction. On this episode, Endangered Species, bringing back a once decimated population to New York Harbor. Island Man, a 15-year love affair with the island and what it spawned. And Puppy Power, keeping vistas and visitors on the island safe with the help of some furry friends. Those stories and more coming up as we explore Governor's Island. A high school on Governor's Island is leading the way in restoring a long-diminished species to New York Harbor. Donna Hanover has the story on how students are helping to make an impact on coastal erosion and water filtration in New York City. These teens are part of the Urban Assembly New York Harbor School. The school is part college prep and part vocational. It teaches students from all five boroughs environmental ethics and hands-on skills associated with careers on the water. The New York Harbor School here on Governor's Island is the flagship school behind the nonprofit Billion Oyster Project, or BOP, a long-term effort to restore one billion live oysters to New York Harbor. BOP Executive Director Peter Malinowski says New Yorkers ate lots of oysters in earlier centuries. So they were consumed by rich and poor alike in New York City, sold from carts, and also packed into barrels, salted, and shipped all over the world. After we ate all the oysters, farmers actually imported seed oysters from points south in the Delaware Bay and the Chesapeake Bay and brought them up to plant on New York Harbor beds. And that worked until the completion of the aqueduct. And then New Yorkers had as much water as they wanted, and so they took as many showers and flushed as many toilets. And, it, and all of that wastewater went right out into the rivers. People started getting sick, and then by the early um, sort of 1900s, they closed all the shellfish beds. Restoring those shellfish beds is a multi-pronged process. Hatchery manager Rebecca Resner says the Harbor School students do a lot of the hands-on work in this effort, including building oyster cages and growing oysters. The junior class right now is growing all the microalgae that you see, um, which is a hard skill to acquire. They're growing it to be fed to the oysters. Beyond just feeding oysters, the BOP uses its lab to create the right conditions for oysters to have babies in tanks. They also collect oyster shells from restaurants, dry them out for about a year, and bag them to put in the tanks. Each baby attaches to a shell as an adoptive home, and then batches of them are installed in the harbor to start reefs that can then attract wild oysters. In addition, some oysters are kept in mesh bags connected to piers and measured often to find out what helps them grow. Scientists from Baruch College are part of the team. So are high school students from the New York Harbor School, guided by aquaculture teacher Roy Arezzo. Well, you need to know two things. The life cycle of the oyster, right? You're not going to put a brand new hatched out, born oyster larvae in the set tank, right? That's not a good idea. You also need to know the flow chart of the process of growing oysters alongside the BOP in this lab. 
Classes like these teach students like Kevin LeYoung and Athena Zimmerman that oysters are a keystone species in New York Harbor. Did you sometimes think a little teeny oyster, what kind of difference could that make? Well, before coming to Harbor School, I didn't really understand what a dif uh, the difference an oyster could make, but now knowing that a, one teeny tiny oyster can filter 50 gallons of water a day each, then one billion could filter so many more. Look, we have a vast reach of harbor, and I guess we have to start here and then we'll branch out. It's a big impact, especially in future generations. This is going to leave a mark, and it um, feels like I'm doing something important. More important than she may know, Baruch College Assistant Professor Stephen Gosnell explains just how essential oysters are to both our land and our waterways. They prevent erosion, they actually act as a wave break for storms that are coming in and help reduce those impacts. They help filter the water so the oysters feed by bringing the water in and they can cleanse the water that way. As they do that, they produce waste and that waste actually acts like a fertilizer for sediment microbes. So these microbes that are in the sediment around them and in and on their shells can actually help remove nitrogen from the water column. So there's all these different things that they do and that's why there's such an interest in restoring them here in New York. The turnaround will take many years, but it is underway, and the Billion Oyster Project says they'd like your help. You can come to the island, sign up on our website, volunteer, and do many different kinds of tasks. We also have a citizen scientists program um, where people will have ORS cages, so oyster research stations, and they can take data and give it back to us. I'm Donna Hanover for Diversity. Over the past 15 years, Kevin Fitzpatrick has developed a unique relationship with this island. He shared some of his story and some of this island's amazing history with us. Gary Pierre-Pierre has the details. I was on one of the first ferries to come out here on a weekend and I just fell in love with the place. It has that secret, hidden, lost quality of an undiscovered gem right here in New York Harbor. And so I just fell in love with the place. And now I come out here about 30 or 40 times a year. Kevin Fitzpatrick is an independent tour guide with Big Apple Fanatics Tours. He's been leading tours on Governor's Island for the past 15 years. So when I first came out here, there was no information. I mean, there was no signage, there was no books. Um, it was very hard to find out like what this building is, what that building is. So I started making up lists and I started collecting information from different sources and old books and from the Army records and Coast Guard records to kind of build up the basis of the knowledge to lead tours. And then those tours then led to becoming an expert and able to write the only guidebook to the island. That guidebook was published in the summer of 2016. The book is called Governor's Island Explorer's Guide, Adventure and History in New York Harbor. It's based on all the research Fitzpatrick collected during his 15 years of visiting the island. So it has everything going back to the Native American era to today in the hills in the new park. So it has more than 200 years of history of the island, which is fun because it's a completely unexplored place. I mean, we're so close to Manhattan, but really nobody had done this kind of book or this kind of research on the, all the buildings, all the places, all the parks, all the street names. So that was a lot of fun to research and write about. Governor's Island got its current name in 1664. That was during the island's British colonial era after the British took over the island from the Dutch. At that time, the island was reserved for New York's royal governor's exclusive use. The governors were officials appointed by the king to serve as chief law enforcers in the 13 colonies. This was the, the playground for the royal governors. So that's why it's not apostrophe S, because it's not possessive, it's plural, governors. The governors used the island for a number of reasons, from hunting and breeding pheasants to leasing it out to other entities for profit. The island was once designated as a quarantine station for refugees for a short period around 1710. As passenger ships came over from Europe, if those passengers were sick, they would quarantine them here on Governor's Island until they were healthy enough to continue on the journey into Manhattan. 
And a lot of them, particularly the Palatine, who are from England, they came over and they went from Governor's Island to the Hudson Valley. So today, more than 250 years later, there's many, many descendants of those immigrants that are living in New York State that had come over through Governor's Island and now they live up in the Hudson Valley. After this period, the island remained relatively untouched until the American Revolutionary War in 1775. The island remained in U.S. military hands for almost 200 years, and it was the site for many historical meetings. The porch we're sitting on right here, which is the old commanding general's house, um, every famous general from the American army in the 20th century pretty much came on this porch. And other people like the Duke and Duchess of Windsor were here, Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev had a summit, they came onto this porch. Um, so this house has seen a lot of really great history. Another significant aspect of the island's history stems from its relationship with the U.S. Coast Guard. The Coast Guard took over the island in 1966 and they remained here for the next 30 years. The island became the largest Coast Guard base in the world. It was also home to the world's first search and rescue training school. By 1985, the island had a population of 4,000 personnel and 1,000 family members. They had schools here, um, and they were doing um, protection work around the region. Um, so there was a number of Coast Guard cutters that were docked here. And what the Coast Guard did is they built this up as a small town. Well, they had a bowling alley, they had soccer fields, and Little League, and Boy Scouts here. So it was a really family place. It was a very, very all-American place a lot of people loved. The Coast Guard left the island in 1996, and a few years later, the federal government turned it over to the city and state of New York for a dollar. Redevelopment on the island was initially slow, but by 2005, the island was open to the public as a park. There was two rules, no casinos, so sorry, no gambling out here, and no one can live on the island, so there can't be permanent housing. Even with all of the knowledge that he's accrued over the years, Fitzpatrick says he still wants to learn more, with specific interest in the island's vast Native American history and Coast Guard narratives. The subject of another book, perhaps? I think there's definitely another book in Governor's Island. Um, I've only scratched the surface with the guidebook. For Diversity, I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. The Trust for Governors Island and the folks at Urban Archives are also trying to make it easier for visitors to enjoy the island's history. They have developed an app for that. Urban Archives' Samantha Amadeo tells us more in her own words. Urban Archive is finding an innovative uh, way to bring history to life and make it not only uh, relevant, but accessible. We actually do a series of historical history hunts or scavenger hunts uh, throughout the city. Everything that we do is app-led. So um, working with the Governor's Island, we were able to compile a series of historical photographs across the island. And when visitors or tourists came to the island, they were able to open it up find a clue, try to uncover where its location is on the island, look at the old photo, stand in front of it, and check in from the app. So we've done that hunt with them twice now, and this summer we are working with them to find more ways to engage people in the history of the island. Um, it's so rich and um, there's so much going on there. And so but part of the idea with creating a tour was to be able to use um, history and historical photographs, um, lay it um, on a map for, for that, uh, so that people really walking around can be able to open it up um, and see history where it happened. You could take the tour in any, um, in, in the order that you would like. Basically, Governor's Island has put together a series uh, of comments and photos that they've wanted to share with the public. And while you could take it in a particular order, it's really open to you to even read it from your bedroom, uh, a different state, or be on the island itself and walk through location, location. One of the really neat features that we've developed for Urban Archive is the photo recreation feature. Um, an example of that is actually when you're walking through the island, you could pull up um, an old photo that has been mapped to that location. You could actually click this camera button that comes onto the screen when you're standing in front of it and take a then and now a side-by-side -side photo of how the location has changed through time. 
Um, and our users often send these photo recreations, as we call them, to us. And I believe the, the number to date is over 15,000 photos over the past two, three years have been recreated. Um, and there's many of them have been done on Governor's Island as well. Yeah, we're looking to expand content that is available on the island. I've talked about briefly uh, working on an audio guide. We currently have walks and stories that, you know, uh, visitors or tourists or just New Yorkers can, you know, access from the island. But um, we're always open to adding additional archives, new photos. Uh, they could create additional stories and feature that weekly on our platform. So whether or not, let's just say it's the winter time and and people can't make it to the island, they could still tell a lot of the stories through our app and deliver that to people wherever they are. Guyana born artist Carl E. Hazelwood is currently developing new work at the Triangle Arts Association residency program on Governor's Island. It's the nonprofit art institution's first year on the island, and while idyllic in many ways, Governor's Island does pose some unique challenges. Judith Escalona tells us more in this report. On Governor's Island, Carl E. Hazelwood recently began his artist residency. He's one of five artists selected by the Triangle Arts Association, a Brooklyn-based arts organization that has been providing artists with space to work for the past 40 years. It was founded by a sculptor, a very famous British sculptor who lived in America. His name was Anthony Caro. He's in all the muse museums and so on. And he had an estate upstate. And uh, his friends would come on the weekends and they would make things, you know? And after a while, you know, I guess it became more formal. Becoming formal meant creating an organization to provide artists with studio space. Barbara Bird is program director of the Triangle Arts Artist Residency um, Programs. It was started in upstate New York um, and kind of just bloomed and blossomed into something that really um, has become sustainable and really well known in the art world. Better known for their residency program in Dumbo, Triangle recently opened an additional space in Governor's Island. It's a much longer residency, running between the months of June and October, which offers artists a secluded and tranquil environment in which to work. But it does have its drawbacks. There are rules, because it's a special place. Um, one has to be off the island by six for most days, except for, I think, Friday, Saturday. Friday and Saturdays, um, which for an artist is a little peculiar because we artists, we work all kinds of hours. We work through the night sometimes. That means adjusting to the ferry schedule or else. But here, you don't want to be stuck with the last ferry gone because it's a big sin. I don't know what they'll do to you, but <laughs> they'll do something. So, but, so we have to get the rhythm of, of getting here and learning how to deal with the time issue. And yet Hazelwood is pleased with his workspace in building number seven in the Nolan Park section of Governor's Island. The space itself is phenomenal. You know, it's beautiful, it's high, high ceilings and um, a space to breathe. It's beautiful outside, it's gorgeous, you know, surrounded by water, you know, it's, it's great. It's a little oasis in the middle of uh, New York City. According to the Trust for Governor's Island, the organization charged with developing the area, nearly half a million people visited the island in 2015, and that number has continued to grow. On the weekends, it's really very, very busy. People come and go all constantly, you know. People walk through here, it's nice to talk to people. A few of them are artists, and others are just curious. They want to know, oh, what's that, you know? What are you doing, you know? I've even got somebody from the Museum of Modern Art who knew instantly what I was doing, knew better than I did. Now in his first month of residency, Hazelwood has been working on a new piece, exploring an eclectic aesthetic of mixed media. This and other abstract works on paper hang in an improvised exhibition area adjacent to his workspace. According to Bird, Hazelwood was an ideal candidate for the newly launched residency program. What kind of work can be brought to an island like this? 
Governor's Island doesn't have any working running water. Um, you have to travel somewhere else for bathrooms. And it's very kind of do it yourself, the way the spaces kind of function. Um, so we were thinking about the alumni and how they can not only use a space that's very domestic, but also thinking about how can they kind of complement each other and also how can they speak to the audience. Carl has a great presence when he talks to people. He's very um, kind of, he's very charismatic. He's very um, inviting and his work in general is very inviting as well. The Triangle residencies as well as others have allowed Hazelwood to create a substantial body of work. He now sees presenting the work as his main challenge. I've only started to focus on like showing rather than making things, you know, there's this other part of the equation where you, ha you, you make stuff, but you have to get it out into the world. On the weekends, you can see the stuff Carly Hazelwood and other Triangle artists are making in building number seven of the Nolan Park section of Governor's Island. Judith Escalona, Diversity. Finally, while Governor's Island is filled with fun activities, events, and beautiful green spaces to relax, there's a lot of work that goes into maintaining the island's scenic landscape. That's where the working dogs come in. Our CUNY TV intern Eunice Adekoya reports. Governor's Island is known for being a tourist attraction and an escape from the busy New York City streets. But the island is facing a threat, Canadian geese. The working dogs of Governor's Island have come to the rescue. Meet Max, Quinn, Chip, and Aspen. We have four dogs currently. So Max is our oldest. He's our veteran. He's nine years old. And we realized that we needed an additional dog to supplement his work. So we got Quinn. Uh, Quinn is three years old now. We have Chip, who's almost two years old, and Aspen, who's just one year old. So um, they are growing as a team and uh, working as a pack. Good dogs. Molly McGinnis works closely with GI's working dogs and is also the director of operations planning and sustainability. Boy. So Quinn has to like wind herself down a little bit. <laughs> Quinn. I work with our entire organization to make things run a little bit more efficiently and think long term about how the organization is going to grow. And I also am in charge of our sustainability initiatives, everything from our waste management to our energy consumption, as well as our dog program, which is to help keep geese away from the island in a sustainable way. Go, Max! Go! Go! The geese problem on the island has been an issue since the park opened to the public in 2014. And when did you guys realize that the geese were becoming a problem to the visitors and to like the lawn? Canada geese are really attracted to large green spaces like the one we're standing in now. And so when we first opened the park, we had a really large population that was spending a lot of time here doing a lot of damage and the visitors weren't as comfortable with the geese being around. That's because the geese are very aggressive with visitors. They also eat the turf, grass, and plants and can potentially spread invasive species on the island that can strangle existing vegetation. Canada geese can eat four pounds of plant material each day, and then they also poop out one pound of material every day. So having a population of 100 geese on the island can lead to a huge mess, and it also does a lot of damage to our landscapes. So originally we tried all kinds of methods to keep the geese away, and they weren't very effective. We tried RC cars, we tried strobe lights, we tried flags and other things that kind of um, block their point of view. But really one of the only things that's worked is having the consistent dog presence on the island. These aren't just any dogs. Quinn, Chip, and Max are border collies, well known for their herding techniques. Aspen, the newest member of the pack, is a mini Australian Shepherd, a breed that's known to have similar herding tendencies. So Max, with his sheep herding school, he's really um, great with a lot of commands. He knows which way to go left and right. He's really great at stopping. Other dogs have more of an aggressive like chase to kill instincts. Border collies don't have that at all. Their job is to chase the geese, but not to harm them. The other dogs have actually started to just work really naturally in tandem with them. So we work on a lot of basic training, just stay and come, um, making sure they're staying in the golf cart until we're ready to approach the birds. Um, but then Max really is the leader, takes off, and the rest of them kind of follow around them. They create this really great kind of oval around the geese. The geese fly away, and they're really effective at doing their job. 
the dogs are also treated as real employees of the trust. While they are also employees of the trust, so are their owners. Um, so they do get vacations, they get breaks, they get to go home some nights and spend time with their actual families, but they know that when they're on the island, it's really because they're here to work and help keep the island geese free. They're also really popular on Instagram, garnering over 8,000 followers on the social media platform. They have a lot of fans from all over the country. Uh, people will message us and ask if the dogs are going to be here on the weekends that they're coming to visit the island. Um, and they're just a really great benefit, um, not only for the ecological benefit, but for the kind of mascot they provide as well. Molly also says that the working dog program is here to stay and that they're going to stick with the Border Collies for a while. Reporting for Diversity... I'm Eunice Adekoya. That's our look at Governor's Island. Join us next time when we'll head over to the Rockaways to find out more about what's going on in that part of our diverse city.